Hello and welcome to our latest Global Fleet Champions webinar. If you're new to our webinars, Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Brake, the road safety charity, to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. Please visit our website, globalfleetchampions.org, to find out more. As organisations understand and adapt to changes brought by the COVID-19 pandemic, Today's webinar gives essential guidance to help fleet managers continue to manage work-related road risk during this unusual and difficult time. On your screen now, you should be able to see a multiple choice question poll so we can find out your views on this topic. It is anonymous, simply select one answer and press submit and we'll discuss the results at the beginning of the Q&A session, which is also your opportunity to ask some of today's presenters any questions you might have. You can put forward your questions at any time during the webinar by using the chat box on the webinar panel. Thank you for your time and the webinar will now begin. Good morning. DTEC have been working with Brake since the late 1990s and are happy to once again be assisting Brake reach out to more companies and their transport related managers in the aim of reducing death and injury on our roads. More recently, DTEC sponsored the Traffic Manager educational video and created a range of employee lose your license, lose your livelihood awareness posters, which are available from both Break or from DTEC. For the past year, we have been pushing the awareness of more drugs than drink our work with the police in every force across England, Wales and Scotland shows us that we are catching more drug drivers than drink. Merseyside and Essex were catching over 2,000 drug drivers each during 2019 and that was some 30% more than drink drivers. During the past six weeks, with supposedly one third of the traffic on our roads, the police are catching even higher numbers of drug and drink drivers. Just to highlight the hashtag more drugs than drink, Merseyside caught 90 drink drivers and 160 drug drivers in the first five weeks of the lockdown. Just recently, Essex also reported that in a shorter time of just four weeks of April, they arrested 86 drink drivers and a massive 266 drug drivers, with another 36 too scared to give a roadside sample and taking the automatic punishment for a refusal to provide. This could have been 300 drug drivers in one month for one of our 43 forces. And I find that shocking. So in light of these exceptional times, we all as road safety professionals or proponents need to consider how our drivers are behaving both now in lockdown and in the future as we gradually come out. DTEC are convinced that educational webinars are a great way to continue spreading both the message of road safety and also a perfect place to pick up practical tips and solutions to issues that many companies will be experiencing. We have in this webinar essential steps for driver recruitment and training, so conducting license checks and managing risks associated with younger drivers, scheduling and routing journeys for safety, this is, for example, ensuring drivers adhere to best practice guidance around driving hours, despite any relaxation of driving regulations. How to manage driver health and well-being that can include anything from stress or fatigue and even drink or drugs. Finally, the vehicle maintenance and checks to ensure all vehicles are roadworthy before every journey especially important if they've been stood aside for a number of weeks. I hope you enjoy the presentations and that they stimulate some ideas or refresh your priorities. If you have anything you would like further advice upon, please contact either Brake or DTEC. Best regards and stay safe.
enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you to Brake for allowing me to come along and share my thoughts on managing road risk during the current pandemic. Uh, you're going to hear three presentations after this. Uh, and just to let you know, these were all recorded before the situation began. So what I'm going to focus on is actually the changed risk environment, which we all find ourselves in. Um, and as a result, what we may need to consider to manage risk effectively in this new situation. What I won't be doing is focusing on some of the things that employees need to do to prevent the spread of the virus. I think that's probably covered well elsewhere. But what I will be focusing on is things to do to prevent collisions from occurring in this new environment. Now, you'll have all heard or seen on the news wherever you are uh, about articles related to the virus. In the UK, where I am, Fleet News have been talking about um, changes to um, driver's hours rules, um, changes to the requirement for um, MOT tests, so that's safety tests for vehicles, uh, and also changes in driver medical certificates for truck and bus drivers. What this doesn't mean, and I want to emphasize what this doesn't mean, is it's not safe to allow employees to drive for however long they want, to drive in defective vehicles, or to drive with a known untreated medical condition. The risks haven't changed. There's just a temporary relaxation of in the enforcement of the laws, not the laws themselves. And this is probably the most important slide I'm going to show today. You have exactly the same duty of care to employees and I guess something which often gets overlooked, those people who your drivers share the road with, especially vulnerable road users. Around the world, vulnerable road users make up roughly 50% of all the killed and seriously injured statistics that we see. So they're a very at-risk group. Always remember that where specific legislation does exist, this is often an absolute minimum that you should be doing to manage risk. And this often falls well short, falls well short of what is considered good practice. So as an example, current best practice is for drivers to take a break every two hours or sooner if they start to feel tired, which goes well beyond one aspect of the driver's hours rules. So why not use these unprecedented times that we find ourselves in to revisit your safe driving policies and procedures and enhance them where necessary to meet current good practice? Remember, the risks have not changed, so it does not make it okay to ignore any changes to regulation or enforcement. So this is a recent picture from Berlin. Um, it could be anywhere in Europe or probably anywhere in the world. Relatively empty streets uh, and reflective of, uh, of where we find ourselves. Um, my German isn't very good, but I think the road sign says something along the lines of avoid the roads, avoid contact, hashtag we stay at home. So the things I've noticed when I've been doing my daily exercising or driving to the supermarket in the UK, um, in urban roads, there's a lot more vulnerable road users around. Um, there's inexperienced or less confident cyclists who are more prone to wobbling and swerving. Um, and something of particular concern to me is that where walkers and joggers are approaching each other on pavements, um, sometimes one or other will step out into the road to maintain that two metre gap between them, sometimes without looking because the roads are that much emptier. And your drivers need to account for these changes in behaviour, especially if they're driving in urban environments. Drivers, drivers themselves may be busier. If you've got people providing essential services, that might, they may be busier, there could be increased demand, they could be covering staff absences at the moment. Uh, and all this may lead to more stressful drivers out there on the road. And we'll explore more about what that means later on. Now, when we're looking to manage risk, perhaps a, a good place to start is the four main reasons why serious collisions occur. They're speed, fatigue, distraction, and impairment. And we need to consider how the current risk environment we find ourselves in has impacted on these areas and what we may need to do to manage things differently. If we start off with speed, well, the roads are a lot emptier, they're less congested, and that provides drivers more opportunities to speed. 
Now, in the UK, we're seeing evidence of increasing speeding fines and some actually, quite honestly, outrageous speeds on the relatively empty roads. And your drivers, they may think that actually going faster so they can get to their destination quicker may be helping out the organization, especially if they're doing essential journeys. Now, this side, slide from the Global Road Safety Partnership perhaps explains why that's not a good idea. We know that speed plays an important part in the likelihood of a collision occurring and the subsequent severity of that collision. And with more vulnerable road users around, and remember I said earlier, they make up roughly 50% of the killed and seriously injured statistics around the world, then this is not a time when you should turn a blind eye to speeding. You should make sure your employees understand this, and wherever possible, you should be monitoring this, and we'll circle back to that later. The last thing anybody needs is to put an unnecessary burden on your local health service and the emergency services who have to come and deal with it when you are involved in a collision. Moving on to fatigue, um, employees who are working in essential areas, they actually may be working longer hours um, just to, to service the, uh, the, the increased needs at the moment. Some drivers might be getting poor quality sleep because of worries or anxieties about catching COVID-19 or fearful that their family members will. Ensure drivers stop and take a break whenever they feel tired. Two hours should be the absolute maximum time behind the wheel. Some employees will be fixated with the news and will be want to be continually updated on what's happening, increasing temptation to use their smartphone to stream videos. So, for example, in the UK, uh, f roughly five o'clock every day, we have an update from the, um, from the government uh, about the latest situation. Employees may be tempted to watch that. You may have people working at home for the first time and, and having less contact with colleagues might increase the temptation for them to use the phone to actually contact those people who they're missing. Similarly, concern about the welfare of family members increases the risk that drivers will call them whilst driving. Now, we know that even a hands-free conversation, so ignoring all the use of social media, watching videos, updating, uh, updating um, statuses, we know that just having a hands-free call increases the risk of being involved in a collision by a factor of four. And the driver will have similar reaction times to somebody at twice the UK drink drive limit or three times the drink drive limit in most of the rest of Europe. It's vital to reinforce the message that employees must not use their phone whilst driving. Finally, looking at impairment, well, some employees will be drinking more at home due to worries and anxieties. Clearly, there's an increased risk there. Um, they may be using more medicines. Uh, they may be worried about, uh, uh, about uh, their health. Uh, they may... Uh, not engage with pharmacists and doctors perhaps as they used to from a social distancing perspective and we're also in hay fever season so they may be taking um, remedies for that and some of those remedies will include drow in induced drowsiness so it's important to remind employees of the risks especially concerning morning after drink driving you know maybe provide some education about how they can calculate when they're going to be alcohol free and therefore okay to drive and also the possible side effects of medication So turning on to what effective work-related road risk management looks like, and, and just, to, just to make it clear that this picture was taken well before um, the uh, current lockdown uh, situation in Europe. This is Madrid. I think it's vital that any organization wants to man manage its work-related road risk use an effective process based on the proven health and safety principles of plan, do, check, and act as these relate to, to the driving task. And this is what an effective um, risk management process looks like. Now, we haven't got time to go into, into depth, but suffice, suffice to say that all of the elements are important. So if there's bits of this that you don't have in your risk management programs at the moment, then perhaps now is a good time to revisit that and update it, especially if you're in a position of having some spare time just because of the change of a uh, uh, situation you find yourself in. So just as an example, uh, when I'm working with an organization, manager training, which is part of the first part, uh, an vital part of the first part of the process in the plan section, not many organizations do that. 
not many organizations uh, train their line managers and supervisors uh, in their roles and responsibilities uh, for managing the, the work related road risk program. Um, not many people uh, tell them that actually they're the controlling minds, that they have a massive influence over how a, an employee will behave whilst driving. And not many people train them how to do post incidents and debriefs to get down to the root cause analysis, root cause of why that, that collision occurred. But the two critical elements, as you'll see around the outside of the process, are management and culture. And these are the key success factors of getting any effective um, work-related road risk management program right, producing a continuous um, uh, improvement in road safety performance. Now, management refers to the overall management systems, and this includes not only safe driving policies and procedures, but how these fit in, how these dovetail into your operating practices and procedures. And it's often the latter that need to be modified to create an environment in which drivers can drive safely. Now, strong leadership is vital in ensuring the success of any road-related road risk management program, as you'd expect. And we're going to hear more about that later in a session by Colin Patterson from DriveTech. Culture refers to the on-road safety culture, where employees drive safely not because they have to, but because they want to. Now, this takes a lot of time to develop, and this isn't something you're going to do um, overnight, but the effort's well worth it. Um, uh, and in a company where there is a strong safety culture, things tend to happen um, regardless of, uh, of, of what you have in place. When we're talking about journey management, journey planning, uh, obviously the most important question to ask yourself in the current environment is whether the journey is absolutely necessary. If it is, then there's a couple of extra considerations that you, you need to take into account. For longer journeys, check that the rest stops are still open and plan where you're going to take your regular breaks because you can't assume everywhere is going to be open. And because of the increased number of vulnerable road users in urban areas, if, if at all possible, um, av avoid planning your route through those, uh, through those areas. Not always possible, but if it is, that's going to be a, a tremendous benefit. Well-being is tremendously important at this time. Uh, and there's a session later by Re Rebecca Posner. So I only want to mention a, mention a couple of things here. So you might have employees working from home who are not used to doing this, and they might find this stressful. Some people may embrace it, some people might find it stressful. Some employees may have anxieties about themselves or family members catching COVID-19, or they may be worried about losing their jobs due to the financial impl implications about when all this is over. Now, all of this could lead to changes in behavior, such as increased alcohol consumption, changes in eating patterns, and difficulty sleeping, all of which have obvious implications for road safety. Now, if you don't provide confidential employee counseling services, such as a helpline, then perhaps now will be a good time to introduce one. I mentioned earlier that the, the, the development of an on-road safety culture was one of the key success factors in any effective work-related road risk management program. Uh, and the communication strategy that you have in place to achieve that, drip feeding safety information in on an ongoing basis, is, is one of the key things to, to achieve this. But effective communication is more important now than at any time. As I mentioned uh, uh, a minute ago, you may have employees at home who are not used to working in isolation. They may be anxious, anxious as we've discussed. So make sure you're talking to your teams and your individual employees regularly using whatever methods are, are practical for you. Now, Zoom team meetings are particularly popular at the moment. We've seen that on the, on, in the media. Regular telephone calls, emails, texts. Find out what combination of communication works best for you and do it. Now, obviously, this is another picture that was taken before social distancing. Um, but many of us will have, have pressure to actually get additional employees uh, on board to, to drive. You know, we may have um, employees off work and or self-isolating, uh, or there may be an increase in demand for our services. But this shouldn't be used as an excuse to cut corners. You need to make sure that the person you're in, in, inducting into your business has the correct license for the vehicle that you're asking them to drive and a valid license for that vehicle and also have the necessary experience. It's no good them having the valid license if they haven't driven that vehicle for the last five or 10 years. 
your normal induction processes should apply, albeit you may have to adapt these to reflect the need for social distancing. Don't use it as an excuse to cut corners. And similarly, you know, there's no reason to stop assessment and training. You know, clearly, if, if most of that is in cab or in vehicle, then there are challenges with social distancing. But assessment and training could be carried out online. There's lots of online solutions available. There's lots of app, app solutions available. Um, and this can actually not only help with the, with the, with the training um, and making employees safer, but actually can help with that engagement process, communicating with the, the employees on a regular basis and reinforcing the message that even though we're working in strange times, road safety is still a priority. It's also important to monitor how employees are driving. Um, now, you may have tel telematic systems fitted to your vehicles, but, but you may also have challenges get actually accessing that data if you're working from home as a fleet or transport manager. But if your vehicles haven't got telematics fitted, well, perhaps now's a good time to investigate a number of phone apps that are available that will monitor driver behaviours, things like speeding and patterns of harsh braking, acceleration and cornering, because they can provide tremendous insights into how a vehicle is being driven and any changes to that data is an early indicator of problems which you can follow up and, and manage and nip in the bud. So it's a good time to look into that. I just want to mention briefly collisions and breakdowns because uh, hopefully we don't have collisions because we're managing risk well, but, uh, but they may happen and, and breakdowns may happen. And I think it's important that to think about what advice you give to employees in these situations over and above the usual uh, imperative of managing personal safety. So normally in a collision in a collision or breakdown situation, the advice would all be about managing personal safety. It's where the high visibility jacket is in the car, when to put it on, what door to get out of, where to stand. It's all about avoiding that person becoming uh, subsequently injured in a collision. But there's some extra considerations to think about now. How do we maintain social distancing when we've had a collision and someone's coming to our aid? You know, we, we normally encourage drivers to swap information. You know, you may have tear off cards that are with your insurance details. Well, actually, we probably wouldn't want to be doing that um, just in case the, the driver is infected. So, you know, it's thinking about doing that differently, maybe taking photographs of third party details um, from a safe distance, you know, so leaving yours on the bonnet so that the other driver can come along uh, and take that photograph. And even simple things like, well, how's the driver going to get 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 home if the vehicle isn't um, drivable? You know, we need to think about that because is it safe to get into the to the tow truck or a taxi? Uh, well, maintaining social distancing is a challenge in those, those situations. So, you know, if it's at all feasible, perhaps some someone from the same household can come and collect that driver. Um, you just need to think about these things. I'm going to mention a couple of things about vehicle maintenance, but there's a later session by Phil Lloyd from the FTA. So I'm only going to cover things that I think we need to think about in the current environment. So if you've got furloughed employees at home and, and they've got a company car on the drive, for example, um, to keep the battery in good condition, probably you want to use that vehicle once a week, you know, perhaps for a, a, an important um, uh, trip, like a, shop, to the, a trip to the shops. For all unused vehicles, whether that's at home or in a depot, then you need to make sure that full safety checks are carried out whenever they are first used when things start to improve to av avoid potential breakdowns in the safety imp implications associated with that. And for vehicles that are being used for essential work journeys, uh, obviously the regular safety checks need to be carried out you know, daily for commercial vehicles as normal. Um, and that's regardless of whether the vehicle is in a depot or temporarily uh, at an employee's uh, um, home address. Uh, even where spot checks aren't likely to be carried out by supervisors, it's really, really important that the employee still carries out those uh, those vehicle checks to, to avoid the chance of, um, of the vehicle breaking down and to prevent a defective vehicle from being used. You know, in, the, in these, uh, in these uh, uncertain times, we don't want people using defective vehicles. We want any defects to be rectified before the vehicle is used. I just want to touch on COVID-19 policies. Some of you may have already um, issued some temporary policies and procedures and guidance regarding COVID-19. I'm not going to go into any details here, but, but uh, if you want to uh, um, think about supplementary policies, you'd probably want to cover things like um, effective vehicle sanitization, um, how you interact with customers, 
Uh, and it's just occurred to me that um, that in road safety, from a following distance perspective, in, in, in good conditions on good roads, we have the two second rule. And uh, maybe we need to have the only a full brakes of two meters rule from when it comes to social distancing. We need to think about how to refuel safely, how to take meal breaks safely and use bathrooms safely. And going, picking up on a point I made earlier, you know, maintaining temporary unused vehicles and preparing those unused vehicles back for use when things return to some sort of normality. Now in the UK, the Driving for Better Business website has some great resources and links to help you with that. And you may find your leasing company or training provider has resources too. So check with them. When some sort of normality does return, what might this mean for work-related road risk management? Well, I think there's gonna be some challenges. I think it's inevitable that we're gonna have a serious economic downturn, and that's gonna put pressure on fleet safety management budgets, um, uh, despite the financial benefits achieved from having less collisions. I mean, the direct and uninsured losses that we're saving, um, uh, avoiding when we don't have those collisions. Insurance premiums is an interesting as one as well. I've just got an email today to say that my personal car insurance uh, is going to be, uh, I'm going to get a refund of part of the premium. And I think insurers are under pressure at the moment to provide re, uh, refunds on commercial um, premiums. But we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and I guess uh, the, the likelihood is that due to the um, claim rates being significantly lower than the, the insurers expected due to the the emptier roads and less journeys made, um, potentially there's going to be less upward pressure on insurance premiums at renewal time. So the financial department perhaps has a, not so much a vested interest in funding any road safety program. So there's going to be financial challenges, undoubtedly. But on the plus side, there could be some benefits for road safety. We're already, already seeing cities around Europe um, thinking about uh, more 20 mile an hour or 30 kilometer per hour um, zones, um, thinking about how they prioritize the roads for vulnerable road users compared to, to, to car and truck and, and, uh, and motorcycle uh, riders. Um, and from a work-related road safety perspective, I suspect what will happen is that some organizations will realize that their employees working at home can be just as productive, if not more productive than having them in an office. And that's going to potentially reduce the need to travel, certainly the need for commuting. And reducing mileage is one of the key ways of managing work-related road risks, and it's obviously good for the environment too. So there could be some positives coming out of this. I just want to revisit this slide just to re-emphasize the importance uh, of, of it. Regardless of any changes to the enforcement of any rules and regulations, the risks have not changed. And you have an absolute duty of care to those employees making work-related road journeys and, equally importantly, those they share the road with, especially vulnerable road users, road users who, remember, make up 50% of the killed and seriously injured statistics. And there's more of those on the road at the moment. You need to continue to effectively manage work-related road risks, and you need to consider the current changes to the environment in which your drivers are working and adapt your risk management process as appropriate. Finally, if you don't have a proven and effective work-related road risk management program in place, then now would be a very good time to develop and implement one. Thank you for your attention and stay safe. So good morning, um, I'm Rebecca Posner here from Tiara and I'm going to be talking about the business case for mental health. Um, so I always like to start with a statistic and it is one in six. So what does that mean? Well, one in six adults over the age of 16 in England have experienced symptoms of common mental health disorders in any given week. And that is likely to be an underestimation because of biases in reporting and these only include common mental health disorders. Mental health has been defined in many ways, but these definitions on the screen at the moment highlight the complexity of mental health, whereby being mentally healthy isn't just the absence of a mental health diagnosis or difficulties, but an individual's ability to realise their own potential, to learn, express and manage a range of emotions, form and maintain good relationships, cope and manage change and uncertainty. In 
in order to understand the need for workplaces to look after the mental health of their employees, and particularly drivers, the first thing to understand is the size of the issue. Mental health, the difficulties that those living with poor mental health can face, and the importance of taking care of both one's mental health as well as those towards which we have a duty of care, has received increased attention in recent years, but this is still few and far between. My focus for today is going to be to discuss the importance of taking, care, taking into consideration your driver's mental health and the impact that not looking after the mental health of your employees can have on your organisation and their wellbeing more widely. According to the latest Labour Force survey, there were 28.2 million days lost in 2018 and 2019 due to ill health and non-fatal workplace injuries. Stress, depression or anxiety accounts for the largest numbers of days lost, with 12.8 million self-reported days lost due to, mental, due to poor mental health. When averaging that out, each person takes about 21.2 days off work as a result of stress, depression or anxiety. Now, this is, of course, an average across the entire UK. UK workforce, but does provide us with an indication of the sheer scale of the issue we are tackling. What is more worrying is that these figures are self-reported and therefore are likely to be an underestimation due to the many biases and the stigma still attached to mental health, especially male mental health. These figures also account for just three types of mental health difficulties. There are more than 10 overarching mental health categories and more than 30 different types of mental health difficulties experienced in the UK. Along with a recent HSE report, two additional reports commissioned or conducted with MIND, the mental health charity, in 2017 and 2018, aiming to investigate the impact of mental health in the workplace, identified some alarming statistics. Some of these from both reports include 61% of employees having experienced mental health issues due to work or where work was a related factor. 16% of employees, only 16% of employees, should I say, felt able to disclose a mental health issue to their managers. And 30% of work-related illnesses within the transport and logistics sector were due to stress, anxiety and depression. Absenteeism in the UK um, due to mental health costs UK businesses about £8 billion per year. Presenteeism costs UK businesses between 17 and 26 billion per year, and staff turnover due to mental health difficulties cost 8 billion each year, or a total of nearly 33 billion per year to UK businesses. In order for us to start addressing poor mental health in the workplace, we need to understand what is leading to people developing poor mental health. So, what is it that leads to poor mental health at work? Well, Based on the academic literature, it is evident that the working environment within the transport industry has a strong impact on mental health and well-being of professional drivers. As the published research show and our engagement with the industry in the UK confirms, drivers describe their working environment as highly competitive, with increased company scrutiny for increased technology, long working hours with pressure of just-in-time deliveries and irregular shift work, high demands for continuous mental alertness in a monotonous job, and poor work-life balance, which leads to chronic social isolation. HSE's recent report further supports this, listing seven key factors that impact mental health, with the most reported being workload, which includes tight deadlines, too much work, pressure or responsibility. This factor is reported three times as often as any other factor. Others include lack of support from management, changes at work, violence, threats or bullying, um, role uncertainty, such as lack of clarity about the job or uncertain what meant to do, and lack of control, so no say over what or how to do a job. But what does all of that mean on mental health? Well, as well as leading to higher prevalence rates of poor mental health, it also leads to increased prevalence rate of of sleep problems and chronic fatigue, higher levels of social dysfunction and loneliness, but more worrying in the transport industry, particularly with freight drivers, fewer are seeking professional support to manage their mental health. While many organisations have become aware of the impact of poor mental health on overall health, what isn't as known is the impact that poor mental health can have on driver behaviour directly. If we take the example of stress, 
As we mentioned, those who drive for work are more likely to experience stress, in part due to their working environment, and they're less likely to seek support. Now, I'm sure that for most of you listening today, your top priority is safety, ensuring that drivers get from A to B as safely and securely. Firstly, stress is dynamic, which means that things from different sources interact with each other. For example, stress can be transferred from one environment to the other. What that means is that increased work-related stress as a result of increased demand on drivers, for example, can be combined with stress occurring in someone's personal life. So if someone is experiencing stress at home, that stress doesn't disappear when they arrive at work or get into their vehicle, but instead that gets transferred or added to the stress they're experiencing at work, the driving environment and the driving task. And what that means in terms of road safety is increased self-reported crash involvement, increased cognitive lapses, increased driving areas and increased traffic violations. And that's just the impact of stress. There's a growing body of evidence linking poor mental health more widely, such as the conditions shown on the screen, to risky and dangerous driving behaviour. That can lead to increased likelihood of committing lapses in driving, increased traffic violations in driving areas, and ultimately increased self-reported crash involvement. Now, all employers have a duty of care towards their employees, and not looking after employees can have a number of significant impacts of, on your organisation itself. Collisions and incidents are just the top of the iceberg. Poor mental health can lead not only to poor customer service, increased fuel consumption, consumption bent metal costs, higher insurance claims and poor company reputation, but more importantly, putting the lives of your drivers at risk. A company always strives to be the most efficient, profitable and achieve high customer service. But if the operational practices of your organisation are leading to increased prevalence of poor mental health, which can translate to higher absenteeism, higher presenteeism, higher staff turnover, poor staff morale, increased likelihood of being involved in a collision and damaging a company's reputation. Are the current practices really the most effective or do they in fact need to be amended to reduce the negative impact on driver mental health? Um, so thank you very much for listening um, and I hope you have a lovely day. Hello, my name is Phil Lloyd and I'm the Head of Engineering for the Freight Transport Association here in the UK. I've been asked to do a short presentation for you today on vehicle checking and maintenance procedures, a subject that has been a big part of my work in life. As I spent over 30 years working in the Department for Transport here in the UK, I started my career with them as a vehicle examiner responsible for MOT testing and roadside inspections of heavy goods vehicles and PS public service vehicles. My last 10 years with the department, uh, I spent as a senior manager as the head of policy, the head of operations and head of their transformation. But today I'm wanting to focus on what I see as the basics of good vehicle maintenance, which I think can be viewed in three areas. Servicing, which is aimed at maintaining the vehicle or trailer so as to keep it working both efficiently and safely. Depending upon the vehicle or trailer's use, services could be undertaken every three, six, nine or 12 months. And then the safety inspections. These are periodic inspections aimed at identifying the vehicle's roadworthiness condition and levels of wear and deterioration and to replace or fix any defects. And these are done in between the services. So again, dependent upon the vehicle or trailer's use, these inspections may be undertaken every four, six, eight, or 12 weeks. And then there's the driver's daily checks. These supplement both the servicing and safety inspections by identifying defects that may occur during daily use. As the name suggests, these should be done at least daily. The first two areas, service and safety inspections, are the responsibility of the owner or operator. The daily checks are the responsibility of whoever is driving the vehicle. However, the overall aim is to ensure that as much as is practically possible that the vehicle and or its trailer is safe to use out on the road. But I'm focusing 
on just the driver's responsibilities. So what are these? And when should you really be checking your vehicles and or trailers? Well, three things, your daily check, um, that's the first time you use the vehicle in the day, or if you're on a shift, uh, then it could be your, your, your shift because the vehicle may already have been used in that day. Before you take your trailer out, if it wasn't part of your daily check originally, where if you're connecting up to different trailers uh, from the day, then you need to be checking the condition of any trailer that you're pulling and or its load uh, for security or a change of load. So if you've increased height, length, weight, uh, et cetera, then uh, checking those to make sure that they're both safe, uh, secure. And also when you have some concerns. So when warning lights come on, um, so that may be your ABS lights, uh, tire pressure monitoring, something like that, uh, or any unusual noises. So you may get some rumbling uh, for maybe one of the tires uh, or some, some part of the, of the vehicle may have broken or be rubbing on something. And when you've left your vehicle, maybe for some time, so that could be at services where others may have uh, been peering inside your vehicle, leaving uh, doors on the catch uh, or cut into the to the curtains. But what should you check and what level of inspection? Well, you're not expected to be engineers, so your checks are primarily focused on what is reasonable for a driver to see and to address. There are a number of articles and videos on the subject of driver's walk-around checks. In the UK, we have the Guide to Maintaining Roadworthiness, which explains a driver's responsibility quite clearly, and it has pictograms in there, um, which make it fairly simple to understand. But there are many others, and I would recommend, even if you don't look at these, that you go on, onto the internet, Google a few, and, and check them out, because they can be really useful. But doing walk round checks and identifying issues is one thing, but you need to record them as evidence of the fact. And there are various ways in which you can do this. But remember, once you take the vehicle onto the highway, you are responsible and can be held accountable. So what should drivers be looking for? Well, as I said, the guides I mentioned earlier will tell you, but I thought I would share with you defects that examiners find at the road that could and probably should have been noticed by drivers. So let's have a look at these. I've put these in some sort of order of, uh, of magnitude. First thing is tyres. So you need to be checking obviously for tread depth, but also for foreign bodies that might be in the tread. Checking the walls of the tyres to make sure there's no cuts uh, or fabric that you can see hanging out of them or bulges. So tyres tend to be the biggest issue. Uh, the next one from that, is wheel security. Again, a lot of um, vehicles these days, um, they have the little dials on them that tell you uh, the position of the wheel nuts. Don't always take them as being sacrosanct that your vehicle is secure. Um, the picture there is obviously one that's loose. Um, my suggestion then would be if you're picking up a trailer, then at least be checking uh, these things on the trailer. And braking uh, components. To be honest, it tends to be worse on trailers than it is on vehicles. Um, but again, if you don't look, you'll never see. So if you bob your head underneath, you may find defects like this, where you've got a brake chamber that's completely detached or similar items such as those. Mud guards, vehicle condition. If you've been off road, chances are you may have caused some damage. So a quick look around to make sure everything's fine. Uh, and lights, so both damage and condition. So maybe if you've been reversing, doing some manoeuvres, you may have broken some of your backlights um, or some of your front lights might have been hit and smashed off by low hanging trees. And then finally, uh, suspension. Uh, so these are just the main ones, but suspension, a bit like the, uh, the brakes, have a look underneath. Uh, quite difficult to see defects um, from a non-engineer on a mechanical uh, suspension, but a lot of vehicles now are working on air suspension. So a deflated uh, airbag or an overinflated airbag, as in this picture, to give you a, a good indication of the condition of the vehicle. Predominantly, you know, trailers, uh, again, that suffer uh, mainly from this. And don't forget, nowadays, uh, technology is creeping in more and more. So if you're running modern vehicles, then there's a lot of technology in that. So things like radar and LIDAR systems, which operate emergency braking systems, adaptive cruise control, lane keep, yeah, 
These need to be kept clean and free from any obstructions. There's also other things that are creeping up. So in London, um, next year, they'll be introducing a direct vehicle uh, vision standard. So drivers will need to ensure that the cameras are working, warning signs are available, etc. cetera. Um, so this may, be, may not be the case for you, um, but if there's areas that you're moving into uh, that require particular things of vehicles, then you need to check that your vehicles have those things uh, and that they're working. And then here in the UK, the flavor of the day um, is bridge strikes. Um, so there's a lot of issues over bridge strikes. Um, so make sure you're checking the, the height of your load and or vehicle. You know what that is and that you're checking it you know, when you're going on under any low bridges. Sounds simple, but it's become more and more of a problem. And the simple tip here is those markers that you carry in, in your cab, just set them at zero at the end of the day. It will prompt you to check the height of your vehicle or trailer uh, the following day. And if someone else is using your vehicle, then it will give them uh, an idea of the, the things that they need to do. But the thing to remember, if you don't check your vehicle and someone else does, then you could be looking at fines, vehicle immobilization, prosecutions, or possibly all three. And if you have a crash, then the consequences could be far greater. But why is it important that vehicles are maintained well and operated correctly? Well, fairly simple, really. It keeps you safe as a driver. It keeps other road users safe. It improves the reliability. So well-maintained vehicles will be more reliable and be less prone to, to breakdowns. And if you're working on a just-in-time delivery, then that can be quite helpful. Also, if you maintain your vehicle well, the end, keeping the engine well-maintained, uh, having good tire husbandry, making sure your tires are inflated correctly, etc., then this will not only reduce the emissions produced by your vehicle, but actually can increase your fuel, uh, can improve your fuel consumption. And obviously, uh, the idea is to prevent incidents. But you can have the most well-maintained vehicle, but if they're not driven well, yeah, they still won't be safe. And what are we trying to prevent? Obviously, you know, preventing crashes and incidents, which at best cause congestion and are irritating to road users, including ourselves, and at worst, kill people. I thank you. Hope you found that useful, and thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. I'm Colin Patterson. I'm the head of marketing at DriveTech. I'm delighted to be involved in this webinar, and thanks to Brake and Global Fleet Champions for inviting me to participate. Firstly, just a very quick summary of our business to introduce you. DriveTech offer a range of driver risk management services. We have two operations in effect, a core UK business and an international operation for multi-country clients. We're part of the AA, the Automobile Association, as was known. So we're part of the UK's largest motoring business. The services we provide include driver license checking, online driver assessments and driver profiling, e-learning, on-road coaching and training, and of course, measurement support for our clients. You can find out more on our website, so I won't go on any more now. We all know this, I'm sure, but the key in terms of embedding a culture of safety is without becoming too neurotic about it, that it is dangerous on our roads and concentration and focus is important. And I'll leave driver distractions for another day as that's a subject of its own right. Just some statistics. I'm sure you're all generally well versed in the scale of the issue, but to highlight the World Health Organization calculate that there are currently 1.35 million deaths worldwide a year. And that's nearly 3,700 people dying on the roads every day. And specific to the business community, it's estimated that up to 25% of this toll, and more if you include commuting, are work-related incidents. So onto leadership, the accountability ladder I'm introducing you to now are you or your staff or individuals a leader or a follower? And the question to ask yourself in this visual is, are you accountable for your actions or are you a victim? We use this slide within DriveTech really to just question people's individual values and their own dedication. 
I suppose you could summarize it as personal or individual leadership. You can see the victim behavioral traits below the line on the ladder and the accountable behaviors above. I feel this is a lot like a self-fulfilling prophecy and about personal attitude and individual drive. Well, in road safety, as in any walk of life, this, in my opinion, is a key principle to embed in your organizations, to encourage personal ownership and avoid what I call the waiting room syndrome, i.e. waiting in the crowd for someone else to take the lead. And we'd prefer to encourage everyone, including road safety issues, to take action themselves. Moving on to how organizations might evolve in their safety leadership, in this graphic, we've adapted what is known as the DuPont-Bradley curve, and it will reveal gradually to you. From the left, you can see an ideal metamorphosis from a reactive style within a business, where things are done by instinct, or by compliance, or delegated by management. But in actual fact, often there is seen to be a management apathy. As perhaps there is a more imposed supervision, instead of a reactive style, you end up becoming more dependent. So there is active management, there are rules, there is discipline, and there is some degree of control. So things are beginning to be controlled and imposed on the staff. The next stage in an ideal model is independent activity, i.e. you self-manage. So there is a personal commitment in this instance to road safety, self-care, the development of good habits and your own values. And then at the end, what we hope embeds in organizations is a team spirit interdependent within the team so everyone across the businesses understands for example the importance of road safety they help others there's networking there is support systems and there is a company pride across the business about people's road safety performance i'm sure some of this content is teaching granny to suck eggs but what I've shown here are just some illustrations of key things that should be prevalent in a business to make sure that road safety is on the leadership agenda and imprinted on people's minds across the business. From left to right, of course, a, a basic requirement would be a driver safety policy that is actually clear, published and bought into by everyone who drives on or for business. In the middle of this graphic are interesting communication devices which we would encourage people to update and refresh within businesses. Interesting infographics that talk about distracted driving as the example is there, or I've been cheeky enough to include a brake device, which is the road safety week campaign. Personally, I think it's excellent, but we've used that within our own business to raise awareness for a week at a time. So pick on themes, refresh the communication, and ideally come up with something different to keep it on the agenda. And I've even been naughty enough to include a drive tech white paper this one happens to be about autonomous vehicles. It's our most recent. But anything like that that might be circulated within the business keeps the discussion area of road safety valid and prominent. Embedding a safety culture throughout the organization is important. And this slide is a very, very simple illustration to just indicate that it's important to have positive messaging for the business. This is obviously a sign that you might see on the way in or out of this organization's premises, but it's a constant message for business office staff and visitors that road safety is clearly on the agenda and a daily reminder as they come and go. And this is a device really to say, keep things prominent in people's eyes and keep a regular message. Daily is, is brilliant. In terms of hierarchical leadership in an organization, of course, businesses should always act on facts as well as emotional triggers. And here we're suggesting there are some tangible and measurable facts that come to the fore to reinforce and embed road safety high on a business's agenda. From mainly at the top of this chart, safety requirements, some of which are compliance and have to be conformed to health and safety regulations, occupational health and safety and also just basic duty of care to your drivers. Down through cost efficiencies, so these are tangible measures that you can clearly point to and say that by adopting road safety policies and procedures, we've actually been able to identify reduced costs, so it's saving the company money. Down to sustainability, issues around CO2 emissions, the people, the planet versus profitability, and maintaining a corporate image. They're all important to make sure they're on the leadership agenda 
uh, and of course cascaded and shared with staff. A very quick case study I'm showing you now is one of our own customers, AstraZeneca, who've worked with DriveTech since 2013. And a very quick summary is to indicate that they have embedded a strong road safety culture, of course, with a little help from DriveTech. Examples, training is, is a definite part of their new staff induction. Online driver assessments are used to identify individuals' driver risk exposure. On-road driver training is provided on a regular and revisited basis, and all driver information is available through one single portal. Uh, more importantly, perhaps, they monitor their results. Collisions per annum are now half their global target of five collisions per million kilometers driven. Their number of injuries attributable to road collisions per annum has reduced. Blameworthy claims have reduced. Staff retention is supported by demonstrating that the company actually cares and takes this seriously. And driver statistics and insight helps AstraZeneca to drive their training requirements. The key headline messages in terms of embedding a, a safety culture into the leadership of the organization are as follows. Create a safety culture, make it a default behavior within the business. Build trust, a key value of a safety culture. The management team should lead by example themselves, live and breathe the message. You should listen to your employees and demonstrate that you care, otherwise people start to disbelieve the, uh, the stated intent. Of course, if it's a multinational operation, which many of our customers on the international side are, it needs to suit all types of cultures. So take into consideration not all countries have the same standard approach. So make sure it's modified. The ideal is to create employee ownership. And if you remember the Bradley DuPont curve earlier, move to the right side of the curve, get road safety embedded so, so inherently in the organization that people actually do it as a matter of course and talk about it openly. Make it personal and for life, not just work hours nine till five. And use simple but clear messaging to keep awareness up. And of course, more importantly, as long as the organization that you're in is capable and willing to measure, then make sure measurement is, is always on the agenda and you're working towards continuous improvement of those measures. In terms of this webinar, can't really go into a great deal more detail now, but I hope I've touched some points around leadership and key features that should come to the fore in a road safety policy. Thank you for listening and please, you know, keep driving safely out there um, as that illustration perhaps indicates. And finally, my drive tech contact details are here on the screen. So if you'd like to make contact or follow up outside of this webinar, please do so. I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to our speakers. We are now going to move on to the live Q&A section of the webinar. As you may have noticed, three of those presentations were initially broadcast at previous Global Fleet Champions webinars in 2019, but I'm pleased to announce that we are now joined by Colin Patterson and Rebecca Posner, as well as Andy Price, who you heard earlier in the webinar. You should now be able to see the results of our poll earlier on the screen, um, as you can see, we have 73% of respondents saying they have continued to manage road risk and 27% saying they have not been able to. Um, Andy, would you be able to just talk through these results? Uh, yeah, so I, I guess it's encouraging that three quarters of the of the people on the uh, on the webinar have, have, have been able to manage as normal. Um, not, not surprising that some have found it challenging because I guess they're um, they're finding themselves in different circumstances, got different pressures. Um, I guess that I guess the point is um, what normal looks like, um, because uh, I guess not everybody would be adopting best practices throughout. So just because we're continuing to manage as normal, uh, that's encouraging, but uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't um, opportunities to improve uh, how we manage road risk to to make our um, our, our programs even better and improve our road safety performance uh, even more. But uh, I think it's quite encouraging that three quarters of the people have uh, have managed to sort of, uh, it's business as usual, despite the challenges that we're facing at the moment. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, we have a question here for Colin. Uh, so I will put this to you. Uh, Colin, what qualities of effective leadership do you think are particularly relevant given the impact of COVID-19? 
I'm hoping you can hear me now. Um, it's Colin on the call. Thanks for the question. Um, simple answer. Um, integrity, trust and belief that your leadership really does live and breathe it. So I think the key things are because most people can smell insincerity, I think is just core sincerity from the leadership team. Um, not making too much overexcitement about it. Road safety can be regarded as a bit dull and boring and in the health and safety pile. But as long as I think leaders do talk about it with some sense of belief and passion, you've broken the back. If you just publish a driver document and leave it to collect dust, I guess most people on the call would acknowledge you've probably not broken the back. So sincerity, just genuine sincerity, interest day to day, in aspects of road safety rather than just completely disregarding it. Thank you, Colin. Um, we have a question as well for Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, what advice do you have for fleet managers uh, for managing driver well-being that is specific to the current COVID-19 situation? So yes, thank you for specifying as well that that was recorded a while back. I realised that the good morning probably made it look like I'd lost um, all sense of time in through the lockdown. Um, I think that the main thing I would focus on is trying to stay connected. I know that it's a really, really hard time at the moment for everyone out there and a lot of your workers are essential workers who are doing an amazing, amazing job. Um, but they're going to be faced uh, facing a lot of pressure, a lot of additional stresses and concerns that I hadn't even thought about um, in, in the previous presentations. But a lot of the things that I did mention um, do, still, um, do still stand. So I think the one thing I would really try and focus on at the moment is just trying to stay connected, um, trying to stay in touch with them, um, making sure that they're OK. As, as I think Andy mentioned at the start, um, if you are using telematics, maybe look at that in a non-invasive way um, to try and see if there's any changes in, in driver behaviour um, and try and pick up on that and do it in a, in a, a supportive way as you possibly can uh, would be my, my top tip for that. And do you have any thoughts on how driver engagement strategies might um, have to be adapted to best meet with uh, social distancing guidelines? Yeah, that's that's it's something uh, I think everyone's starting to really wonder, how do we do this? Um, I think that where possible, um, I think one of the points I think Andy again mentioned earlier on uh, was about induction, ensuring that people get all the right information that they need, um, especially as some of you may have just taken on a lot of new members of staff to deal with with some of the capacity uh, requirements that have, have occurred. Um, I would say make the most of technology. Um, it's it's really, really one of the sort of really strong points that have come out of this is realising that we can do a lot um, remotely or at, at a distance. Um, and so trying to make the most of, of those tools, communication tools, but try and do it um, on a one-to-one -one basis. If possible, try and use video conferencing so you can actually see people and it feels a little bit more like a sort of normal conversation. Um, and I know that that's not always possible, but I, that would be, um, again, one of the main recommendations I would go for. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. Andy, media reports show some countries are showing an increase in speeding incidents. How would you recommend that fleet managers stay on top of this? Uh, well, I think, as I mentioned, that sp speed is one of the big risk factors in serious collisions. And with all of these, uh, with the increased number of honourable road users around, we don't want that at all. Even though that the, I, I guess, employees may think they're doing their employer a favour or, or, you know, if, if, for example, delivering to the NHS. Well, if I get there quicker, they'll get their, 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 equi their whatever we're delivering quicker. But actually, because of the risks associated with that, that's that's absolutely not the message that we want to send out. So uh, I think it's uh, and it goes back to the communication. It goes back to leadership and management. You know, we've got to make it very clear to our employees that, you know, we, we, we despite the current situation, despite the increased pressures and just whatever the end goal is, we still need to do our, the job safely. And that involves um, driving at a, a, an appropriate speed within the limit of the road and uh, going back to 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 the telematics point you know if we are monitoring that uh, we know we should be you know checking that uh, the people are obeying this obeying the speed limits and if not uh, having the conversation with them uh, uh, you know in that sort of supportive environment and saying look actually we you know this is an important job but we need you to do it safely so that concludes the live q a section of the webinar thank you very much for joining us today
you should be able to see green with our upcoming webinars. We have several coming up next month, including on, next, on May the 6th, a webinar on safe systems for fleet managers on May the 12th, and a spotlight on driver distraction on May the 21st. All that remains is to thank our speakers again and our sponsors, DTEC International. We hope you found today's webinar. If you'd like to continue any discussions we've had today, you can do so on our Global Fleet Champions LinkedIn page. Thank you very much. Goodbye.